As you see, I've entitled this particular message, The Pure in Heart. And when you think about the pure in heart, I'm sure there are many things that come to your mind. When we think about pure in the physical realm, my mind goes to a mountain lake, pure air in the morning, clear of, and free of pollution, and pure water in a lake where you can see to the bottom and see everything. There's a lot of purity that's oftentimes promoted with the ingredients and cosmetics for people, as well as food. They say it's organic, and sometimes you wonder, is it really organic, or are they just want to charge more? And, and there's all this idea about purity as well in drinking and, and eating food nowadays. And oftentimes, when I think about purity in the physical realm, I think about purebred animals. And of course, in my mind, I had relatives and aunt and uncle who raised Arabian horses and they were all in purebred Arabian horses and I can remember as a very young teenager going out to their place in Moody here and you know as, as the horses would be coming up from foal and and moving forward this the beauty of sitting there and watching the horses run and these were purebreds they were not mixed with any other kind of horse lines and whatnot. And of course, we, we look at that and see grace and see beauty, and that's God's creation. And yet at the same time, there's a, there's a cynical side of purity that we know in history, whether it is Adolf Hitler and the Aryan race, and many subscribe to purity today. And there's the whole idea of what the Pharisees in their form of purity going back to Abraham, yet we know the history books are full of lack of purity in their cases. So I think each time when we think about purity, there are things that come to mind. But when you think about a definition for purity, what does purity mean? Well, I have here on the screen just an idea of a dictionary definition of what pure or purity could mean. Conforming absolutely to a standard of quality, being faultless. And of course, that can go across a whole host of ideas and concepts, whether they're thoughts, whether they're physical creations. And the thing that you think about is when you think about purity is it's oftentimes something that's not mixed. You think of metals. If you have pure gold, it's not alloyed with anything else. It's, it's pure silver. You know, nowadays with inflation being so high, you see now a ramping up of commercials on TV. Don't put your money in the stock market. Don't put your money in anything other than metals like gold and silver. And our gold and our silver is 99.967% pure. So you, you hear this all the time. And basically they're saying that it's not contaminated. It's not fake. It's not false. It's clean all the way through. There's no foreign concept or foreign entities in it. And when we think about purity as well, when we think about God, God is important, or the purity is important to God because God is pure. And God here referencing the God family as it currently exists with God the Father and Jesus Christ. They are pure. And of course, we can think of purity in their perspective because they don't have the contaminants. They're not polluted, whether through their spiritual bodies or even in their minds, which is the more important aspect of it when we think about it. And a pure life is characterized by a disciple of Jesus Christ, a believer of Jesus Christ. We are to strive for purity in our life. And sin is not to be one of those things that determines the choices that we make. It is the pure word of God that is to lead our decisions and thoughts, not the impurity of our human nature entering in. And oftentimes that impurity is associated with motives. You know, you, you hear that term, or I used to hear a term when I was much younger, I don't hear it much anymore. So-and-so is as pure as the driven snow. You don't hear that much anymore, but that was something that was a reference to the purity of snow falling and that particular person's life and their motives. They did the right things, but they also did them for the right reasons. A lot of people do the right things, but they got agendas. They've got motives behind that, and that's in the churches of God, big time today. 
God has a way, though, of purifying and cleansing us from our sins so that we can strive to live for him. And that is our calling as disciples of Jesus Christ. Not followers of Jesus Christ, but disciples of Jesus Christ. We study, and we study for the purposes to change us, and that change in us is what we will hopefully be able to teach to others. That's the big difference between a disciple and a follower. A disciple is learning for the purposes of not just being like someone, but being able to teach to others. And you and I are called to be disciples, not just followers. And you think about it, there's a, there's a purity that we only receive in this life through the justification of Jesus Christ's blood. We were saying about that in one of our songs today. And we'll talk a little more about that in the Bible study a little bit later if you stay. But purity is, is, is not that which appears to be pure on the outside, but what's truly pure on the inside. Even the best person that we may think of in our minds, as far as character goes, there's always a flaw in the human. Every one of us has a flaw. Some of us like to think we're better than we are. But the reality is, that's a flaw right there. And that's the thing that we have to be mindful of about ourselves. Because if we're not, it can lead us far, far astray. Now, when we think about ancient Israel, we think about the sacrificial system that was put in place with ancient Israel and how it was a representation of Jesus Christ's atoning blood. And it was a process that was put in place that was... You know, quite honestly, when you think about it, it was meant to hurt just a little bit financially. And you think about it because when you look at all the, the offerings, whether they were animal sacrifices, whether they were other sacrifices, because not everything was an animal, but when they did those, it cost the individual something in order to do that. Just like there was a cost associated with the sin that required the cost of that particular sacrifice that had to be offered. And that was a process that was put in place. Now, that process was to adjudicate through various sacrifices, a process for which we know Jesus Christ would later come. But during that time, it was a form, a process of bringing and establishing a protection for ancient Israel. We think about the Passover. We think about the protection that they had inside their dwellings with that blood of the lamb or goat that was on the doorpost and the lentil. And we think about the Day of Atonement in the fall and the animal sacrifices that occurred and their representations of Jesus Christ. So we think and we look at that and it happens at two different times of the year. And personally, this is a personal opinion, I think that uh, I've heard many people speak to the fact, well, you know, the Passover was for the church, and the Day of Atonement was, is going to be for the world. And I do see some evidence of that, but I also see evidence of the fact that within Leviticus, it mentions with the Day of Atonement the unknown sins and the sins that we oftentimes have that we don't ask for forgiveness of when we went through the process of baptism. And it's a process of cleansing us through these representations. But it was, there was more to this process than just removing of dirt. You know, I have a couple of scriptures right here that I just wanted to make reference to. And in Exodus 19, verses 5 through 6, it says, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you, speaking of the Israelites, shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Of course, this was God's direction, who was Jesus Christ of the Old Testament, to Moses to hand down the children of Israel. And then later in that particular chapter, in verse 19, it, Moses went down from the mountain, and the purpose for that was to consecrate the people. And one of the things they had to do was to wash their garments. That was a form of the consecration, setting apart for this kingdom of priests to be God's people. They had to get cleaned up. And, of course, we're talking about exteriors here. And 
There's more, though, than what we look, when we look at scriptures, and I've got several of these listed here. Exodus 29, 17 is referenced to even when the sacrificial animals were on the altar, their entails had to be washed. There was still this concept of cleaning to purify even the sacrifice. There was the washing of the priests before they could do their own duties. They had to, you think about Aaron uh, as the high priest on the Day of Atonement. He had to thoroughly wash his body, wash his clothes, and then put them on before he could enter into the Holy of Holies that one day and only day, and only he could do it. Of course, there is the cleansing of the garments, and you think about all these sacrificial animals that were sacrificed, all the blood and guts and gore. I mean, it was not sometimes what you may think. It was a lot of blood, and without a doubt, the garments of the priests who had to perform these things got blood on them. And just because they were doing a priestly service, God still told them, hey, in Leviticus 6, verse 27, I want you to clean those garments as you do your, your activities. So God is about cleanliness. In fact, I believe it's John Wesley. I'm not up on my Protestant commentators, but I believe he was the one that kind of coined this idea of cleanliness is next to godliness, something along those lines. Um, but you see, there's the concept. And of course, we know whether they were Israelites um, or whether they were priests, they were there was a protocol and a process put into place whether they touched a, a corpse or whether they contacted someone with leprosy, which was a disease, both in Leviticus 11 and in Leviticus 13, that there had to be a purifying or cleansing process. Now, I've kind of gone through all of this stuff that's on the physical side in the Old Testament. I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time, so that's why I was kind of going through that rather rapidly. But you see that the, the precepts are laid down, and there is always, it seems like, the physical and then the spiritual. And we look at Israel, we look at the church, we look at the kingdom of priests, we look at the church being a kingdom of priests in Revelation. We see there's all this commonality between the physical, or if you want to go there, the anti-type and the type, something that's a representation of the real thing, to quote a line from Coca-Cola. But oftentimes when we think about the term pure in heart, there's probably two overall verses in the Bible that come to your mind. One, the New Testament, and we'll come to it in time. Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure, for they shall see God. The pure in heart shall see God. And then in Psalms 51, and we'll read this in just a moment, in the Old Testament, we, David speaks to the fact of him needing a clean heart or a pure heart. So it's transformed. Even David understood that, yeah, there's all these written laws that are physical, but that's really not what God's talking about. He's talking about something clean here. All those physical things are representations of something that is to be within here, which is a clean heart. And David thoroughly understood that. In fact, let's turn over to Psalms chapter 51. I think most of us, when we read Psalms 51, we have in our minds, rightfully so, the whole context of Psalms 51 from the perspective of it being the fact that Jesus Christ, I mean, that uh, David rather had sinned mightily. Jesus would use a lot of what David referenced in this psalm later to speak to the heart and the needs of the heart. But when we see what we see here in Psalms 51 is a repentant heart. And of course, this is after Nathan the prophet has come before him and, and brought to his attention the great sin. And, you know, you can discuss and argue if you want. I particularly don't want to argue, but, you know, did he not see all this to begin with? Sin has a way of veiling the eyes, even for those who have God's spirit. And we can enter into justification, self-justification, just as quickly as opposed to looking for the justification through Jesus Christ that we need. But the point of the matter is, is that David came to his senses. Beginning in verse 1, he says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness." According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. This is a repentant heart. 
And after being repentant, he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse from me my sin. He thoroughly, as we'll see in a minute, understands that all that animal sacrifice did not change what was in the heart. And he's asking for a change of heart. For I know in verse 3, my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned. You know, I don't know if you think about that when you sin, when we sin, when I sin. You know, oftentimes we sin against other people. Let's just say you told a lie or you sowed some discord in the church about somebody. You told a tale about somebody, gossiping. And yet, yeah, you sinned against that person, but who you truly sinned against is God. And David saw that. He knew he'd done wrong by Uriah, the Hittite, and he had brought in his wife into all of this, but truly it was God who he sinned against. goes on to say in verse 4, And done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. In other words, there are consequences for my actions. I understand that. I just throw myself at your mercy. But I also understand and know that there are consequences for my actions and what I've done. Verse 5, Behold, I have brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden parts you will make me know wisdom. And I think the important aspect is, you know, yes, we are to seek after truth, but nowhere, notice where God's looking for it. He's looking for it in the innermost part, which he's figured he's speaking of a heart, but he's talking about a mind. That's where he's looking for purity and looking for truth to be. Purify me, in verse 7, with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which are broken rejoice. This wasn't an, uh, an artificial repentance. This was not, I'm only sorry that I got caught. No, this was a deep emotional thing that he felt. And he felt maybe depressed, maybe down. And, and, and that was not necessarily holy about his actions, but about letting God down. In verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. And then the verse we oftentimes think of in verse 10 Created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Do we see here that this Holy Spirit of God, which is given by God, can be taken by God? It happened to Saul. Saul wasn't bad from the beginning, but he was given by God a tormenting spirit, and the Holy Spirit was taken away from him. That's the ultimate effects of sin. And David realized how something so small could lead to something so large. And this could lead to him not having God's Holy Spirit anymore, which obviously points to the fact that the Holy Spirit was within certain individuals, even in the Old Testament. Verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. A willing spirit, one that's not being hard-headed, stiff-necked, impatient, and self-willed, but one that's willing to let God work things out. Not on our timetable, but on his timetable. And then I will teach transgressors your ways. That's the difference between a disciple and a follower. A follower doesn't teach. A follower just follows. And I know that's a small nuance, but I hear that a lot today in cultural Christianity. Oh, I'm a follower of Christ. No, I think we need to be disciples so that we can teach others. I think that's far more accurate than saying I'm a follower of Christ. It goes on to say, and sinners will be converted to you. You know, the Apostle Paul talks about saving people, and it's only because Paul was referencing the fact that he could be put in a situation to point people to God and Jesus Christ, and as a result of that, be forgiven of their sins and be justified by him. It was not the Apostle Paul saving anyone. It was him pointing them to Jesus Christ to be saved in salvation. And you and I can look at David as the same way as a disciple, being able to teach others at the right time to point them to Jesus Christ when that time is appropriate. 
not on our timetable, on God's timetable. Verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltlessness, O God, the God of my salvation, and then my tongue will joyfully sing your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifices, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. But your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem, and then you will delight in the righteous sacrifices, O burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, and then young bulls will be offered on your altar. Again, while the overall priesthood was still in place, while there was not yet a temple, remember David did not build the temple. The first temple was by Solomon. But there were sacrifices at the tent of meeting that had gone on from Moses all the way through. But David had a discernment to understand as a result of having God's Holy Spirit that it wasn't about these animals that are purifying anything. It's about a heart, about a pure heart. And he knew he had sinned greatly, and he asked for God to put within him a right heart. Let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 4. It would not take long for the nation of Israel, even with a temple in place, to go vastly astray and go way off. And it would reach a point where there would be, um, you know, the invading tr uh, armies of Assyria to the house of Israel and the invading armies to Judah of the Babylonians and captivity as a result of sin. But it's not going to be that way forever. In fact, Isaiah points to something futuristic. Here in Isaiah 4, beginning in verse 2, And in that day the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. Now granted, there was a physical representation of that earlier with the returning uh, people that we've been reading in um, Ezra and in Nehemiah, but there's a futuristic aspect to this too. That's going to be another physical return. And this branch of the Lord is none other than Jesus Christ himself the branch for which we are vines attached, if we have the right heart. Continuing on into verse 3, and it says, And it will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who has recorded life in Jerusalem. And then the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. Then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke, and a brightness of a flaming fire by night. Bring up any representations in your mind? Who is in that pillar of fire and cloud by day? None other than Jesus Christ leading the Israelites out of Egypt, out of sin. And here is leading them out out of the sin and the bondage of sin, even in the future. And he goes on to say, For over the glory will be a canopy, and there will be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day and refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. So we see that God's word is full of so many representations. But notice it's all about purity. It's all about looking and pointing people to the individual who's able to provide that in the form of Jesus Christ. Let's turn over to Haggai, chapter 2. You know, we are reading now Jeremiah, but we had read and referenced in our Bible study in Ezra of the connection that Haggai, as one of the prophets, had after the building of the uh, foundation, I should say, for the altar, when the captivity was ending and they were sending people back from, Jerusalem, from Babylon uh, as a result of the Persians allowing this to occur and God working to make this happen. But even when they were given a release, it's interesting to me, it's always, we always as humans, because of our human heart and human nature, always seem to fall in the wrong way. We can be on fire, quote unquote, for a period of time, but when we have to overcome the test of time, we always seem to revert back. Maybe not to great 
devastation, but we revert back to sin in small areas that lead to bigger problems. And here it was that Haggai was having to talk to these people who had been given a lot of favor, come back, start a building. And what does he say? Beginning in verse 5, it says, As from the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. The Holy Spirit was there. God was with certain individuals. Of course, Zerubbabel was one of them, as we read earlier in our Bible studies, and, and Joshua, the high priest goes on in verse 6 and says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more in a little while I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea also and the dry land. And I will shake all the nations, and they shall come with the wealth of all nations, and I will fill this house of glory, says the Lord of hosts. Did that happen during their time frame? I don't think so. I think we're talking about something futuristic here goes on to say, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord. Again, we talk back to precious metals and purity. He's saying all that pure stuff that's physical, that's all mine because I'm pure. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. And he's talking about a physical temple, and there appears to be that Ezekiel's temple, as we referenced a couple of weeks ago, will be in the millennium. But he's also talking about a spiritual temple, the church, that kingdom of priests that we referenced earlier. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. And on the 24th of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask now the priests for a ruling. He's checking, measuring his priests that are physically there on earth. He's going to ask them a question and find out, do they know their Bibles? Are they trimming their lamps, so to speak, as we know from the virgins in the parable that Jesus gave? Are they able to make a discernment by God's standard, not their own? He goes on to say, If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with the fold, or cooked food, wine, oil, or other food, will it become holy? And the priests answered, No. Correct answer. Then Haggai said, if one who is unclean from a corpse, and we talked about this earlier in the physical state in Leviticus, and touches any of these, will the latter become unclean? And the priest answered, it will become unclean. And then Haggai said, so is this people. Of course, this is from God. And so is the nation before me, declares the Lord. And, and so is every work of their hands, which they have offered there is unclean. You know, this is striking because this is after the captivity, after the return of people of Ezra and Nehemiah's time. Notice the relapse in the sin and God's view because they didn't have pure hearts. Is there a lesson for you and I in the church today? I think so. Something for us to at least consider about ourselves. Verse 15, but now do you consider this from this day onward before one stone was placed on the other in the temple of the Lord? In other words, do you ever think about what you're doing? Do you think about what you're doing? Do I think about what I'm doing? It's a very pointed question, one relevant. From the time when one comes to the gain or grain heap of 20 measures, there will be only 10. And when one came for the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there was only 20. God was giving them signs, but they were too dense to see it. We talk about David and his lack of understanding, sin has a way of blinding. I smote you and every work of your hands with the blasting of the wind and the mildew and the hail. And this is after all this great favor has been given to them. They still relapsed into sin. Yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. So consider this, from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day when the temple of the Lord was founded, consider. Is the seed still in the barn, even including the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree? Is it not born fruit? Yet from this day on, I will bless you. In other words, because of this right answer, apparently because of the consideration, now they understand. You see a heart apparently changing because God's now going to be very gracious to them in a way he wasn't even before. And then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, 
saying, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the thrones of the kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations, and I will overthrow the chariots and the riders and the horses and their riders, and will go down every one by the sword of another. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, the son of Sheol, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. This is futuristic. This is a representation of Jesus Christ's return. And there is a form of a type with Zerubbabel of Jesus Christ, taking and putting down all the civil governments and having his government. We also know that it'll come, obviously, to restore true religion as a part of the other part of that being Joshua and Zechariah in the next book, um, uh, as far as that goes. But I wanted to hone in on that because that is a representation of futuristic activities. But notice it's impossible for holiness to be transferred from one to another. But defilement is easily transmitted. It doesn't go both ways. You know, we used to have a saying we heard many times in the churches in the past, don't hear it quite as much, you can't get in on someone's coattails in the kingdom of God. I remember hearing that multitude of times, you know, a wife can't get in on the coattails of her husband, a husband can't get in on the coattails of his wife, and children can't get in on the coattails of their parents. Everyone's individually going to be judged. Not by what you your family believes, not by what your spouse believes or what your parents believe, but by what you do. And I think that's something that's very important for us to get in our minds and understand. We have this next day of God's holy day season, the Feast of Trumpets, coming up. Jesus Christ will return as the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's going to put out all civil unrest and all civil forms of government that are here on this earth. And we see here that the sanctity of something or someone that's dedicated to God can't be transferred merely by contact. It takes more than just contact. In fact, God puts a process to cleanse us, even when we are less than what we should be. Let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 1. We know that Jesus Christ is our Redeemer. We know that Jesus Christ is our Justifier. We know that it is through His atoning blood that we receive forgiveness. That is all true, but there's still responsibility that we must take, and we are responsible for taking up this responsibility. In Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Whew, kind, of, kind of strong there. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah, and he's talking to the Israelites. You think the church today, God may look at from time to time, and see similarities to Sodom and Gomorrah from the sin. What are you multiplied, or rather, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings and rams and a fat of fed of cattle. I had take no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling in my court? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an ab abomination to me. New moon, Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. Even in God's church, he cannot endure the sin. Something for us to think about. I hate your new moons and festivals and your appointed feasts. I have become, or they have become a burden to me and I am weary of bearing them. God bears and is long-bearing towards us. But we see here, there is a point for which he can't deal with it anymore. He's put up with it long enough. You think about yourself. I think about myself. Can you put yourself in this, in this light? Something to think about. Continue on, verse 15. It says, so when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. So it did not matter how many prayers they recited, how long their prayers were, their hearts weren't right. And he wouldn't hear it anymore. Wash yourselves. No, wash yourselves. 
we understand all that physical stuff we'd referenced earlier in the in with the garments and whatnot. That's physical. He's talking about washing the heart and the mind here. Remove the evil from your deeds and from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan and plead for the widow. Now we're looking at things, yes, that are done, but it's also a representation of the heart because the heart will lead us to do the right actions. And God's looking at our heart and our actions. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of God. They didn't fear God. They weren't afraid of God. God won't do anything. We're on the Sabbath. We're on the holy day. But he wasn't, he wasn't having any more of it. There's another reference in Jeremiah 4, verse 14, you can turn to, where it makes reference to this as well about uh, at the house of Judah. Same way, same problems. And of course, when Jesus Christ came, he ran into similar fashion of problems in Matthew chapter 23. Let's turn there. These were individuals that kept the Sabbath, kept the holy days, tithed, kept clean and unclean meats. They were looked at by the masses of being so religious and so righteous. Yet God, in the form of Jesus Christ as a human, was so disappointed, disgusted, and angered by their activities, by their hearts, by their minds. In fact, there are eight different woes listed in Matthew 24. I want to focus on verses 25 through 28. Woe to you, scribes, you lawyers studying the law, Pharisees, hypocrites. In other words, you say one thing and do something else. For you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you're full of robbery and self-indulgence. Putting the self ahead of God. You blind Pharisees. We talked about blindness. David had a form of blindness. The captives returning in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah had some blindness. The Pharisees had blindness. But we don't see in them a desire to change like we saw with David and like we saw even with the captives that returned. We see here insubordinates, hard-headedness, stiff-necked. Oh, no. And Jesus was not going to endure with this. He goes on to say, <clears throat> You clean the outside and leave the inside full of robbery and self-indulgence. Uh, you blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish so that the outside may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which are on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness." You know, that is a scathing review of the religious elite in that time. And I don't know that we really grasp it. We've probably read these things so many times, and we don't really understand the culture which they lived in. You know, people do a lot of things to look religious. They do a lot of things to appear to be religious. And you and I can look at cultural Christianity and spot them and talk about them. But what about us? What about us? God's not a respecter of persons. We know that. If he saw this in them, what's he seeing in you? What's he seeing in me? Something for us to think about. Let's turn over to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> Read verses 20 through 22 here. He says, For if after they have escaped the defilement of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse than the first. Kind of reminds you of Jesus making the comment about how you know, casting out demons, sometimes it made it a matter worse because more came back. And this is speaking of the church that Peter's giving this advice to of individuals that have been called out, but then slowly go back. And usually it is, we call it backsliding in, in, the, time, in the firm of a, a form, rather, of what Isaiah references. And usually it's slow, and it go, if it continues, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is what Peter's talking about to the church. 
For if it would for it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it and turned away from the holy commandments handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. You know, we may look at that, we may see people that we've known in the past, and we see them going through things in life, and they're, maybe they've turned back to cultural Christianity, um, and, and we don't know their hearts, I'll say that, but you know, these types of things should come to our mind because God would not be pleased if they had truly been given understanding, and that same goes for us, and then we choose to go back. You reach in that line of high-handed sin, where Hebrews references the sin that cannot be forgiven. And that's a scary ground to be on, but that's something for you and I to think about ourselves, about the state of our heart. I'm going to reference several scriptures here about God and how we need to allow God's cleansing agents to make our hearts pure, and what those cleansing agents are and how we are to allow that to occur. Titus 3, verses 5 through 6, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord. The important thing that I want to draw out right there is a lot of times cultural Christianity often speaks of all you got to do is just accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and pronounce and profess him and everything's good. That's not what Paul references to Titus. He talks about righteous works that you have done. So you understand that there's responsibility and accountability, and it's not just professing the name of Jesus Christ like cultural Christianity wants you to think. Or you say, I'm just a follower of Christ. No, you're to be a disciple. Being able to do it, and then after doing it, be able to teach others to do it. But understanding all along that your works are not what's making you just. It's Jesus Christ that's making you just. John 14, verses 6 through 17, or 14 through, or 16 through 17. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, which the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Interesting the word sees is in there. We're going to come back to that. Sees him. That's important because the Holy Spirit is what's required for us to be able to see, which is, I think, one of the main reasons why David, when he began to have the light bulb go off, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. He knew the value. Continuing on into John chapter 13, or 16, verse 13. However, when it is the Spirit of truth has come, it will guide you into all truths, for it will not speak of its own authority, not that self-indulgence of the Pharisees, but whatever it hears, it will speak and will tell you the things to come. And those that is how oftentimes, you know, we, we hear this, this common theme sometimes about, you know, conscience is seared with a hot poker, as the Apostle Paul referenced. People don't have a conscience anymore. There's nothing to prick them inside, as, as occurred on Matthew or, or Acts chapter 2. If we have God's spirit of truth and we're not going to allow anything to harm that, it will lead us in the right directions. And sometimes we may not know why you feel uneasy about something. Don't discount that. Don't discount that. John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So the word of God is a purifying, cleansing agent along with the Holy Spirit. John 15, 3, you are already clean because the word of which I've given to you. So the, the word of God is a cleansing agent. Do we study it? Do we think about it? Do we meditate on it? Do we allow it to lead us and, and give us insight into the, the decisions we need to make every day? Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 26, we're referencing husbands to love their wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Representations of the water 
with cleansing. We've, we've seen all that with the physical aspects going all the way back to Exodus and Leviticus. We see now a transition through David, through, through the captives, a, a fall back again with the Pharisees who stopped the transition. And then we see the church, another transition, hopefully going in the right direction. This brings us to Matthew chapter 5. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5, oftentimes looked at as a section of Scripture called the Beatitudes because the word be comes so many times. Sermon on the Mount, as some people reference it as well. But there's an important thing that I want us to grasp about this and think about, verse 8, because it speaks to this purity, this cleanliness, the purebredness, the not having our hearts mixed with outside religions and, and, and trying to make God accept our, our religion and personally because we think, well, you know, those uh, Catholics, they got something pretty good right there. We need to incorporate that. Or, you know, that is not what God is impressed with. Remember Isaiah 4. Remember that. Uh, he is going to have to clean everything, and he's going to have to clean even some things in the church. But remember his disdain for that in Isaiah 1. Here he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart. So there's a purity that's physical outwardly that we need to be looking at because that should be a representation of us, but it shouldn't be like the Pharisees. They were clean on the outside, but horribly wicked on the inside. It should be a transparency of us. And it's all about the heart, um, and it's all about that because that's where our thoughts are. You know, you can do the right things like the Pharisees did, but your motives are wrong, and God doesn't accept it. God may bear it for a long time, longer than most people will, longer than you will or with someone else or I will with someone else. But there does reach a point where he won't bear with it anymore, and it's speaking to a quality of life. I won't turn, but I'll reference this for the sake of time. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. That's why it's so important to have a pure heart. Because it, from a pure heart, the issues of our life, like a water stream coming out from an in-ground spring, the water bubbles up. Well, bubbling out of our pure heart will be the right things God's looking for. It won't be something we're hiding or trying to keep hidden. Let's turn over to Ezekiel chapter 36. It's a, a bit of a problem. We see that we, in order to see God, we have to have this right heart, this pure heart, and it requires him helping us to be able to do it. Verse 25 here in Ezekiel 36 we read, and then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. The physical water doesn't clean you. It's, it's God working in your heart. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall be careful to observe my ordinances. Do deeds and do works matter when God gives you his Holy Spirit? Apparently so. It matters. It matters. We can look at this as a futuristic prophecy, and it is, but it is also what we see happening to the church today. There's a reason why you've received God's Holy Spirit, and it wasn't just so you could walk around and say, I got God's Holy Spirit. There's more to it. I'll reference Galatians 5, 17 in the interest of time. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do things that you wish. That's the age-old problem we all struggle with in this human flesh. I've heard the term, well, that's just my flesh rearing up. True, true. But just like Cain was told, make sure that you get control of that 
we are told to get control of that with God's Holy Spirit. We can't allow just because a thought comes in our mind for the words to come out. We have to allow God to help us to overcome the flesh. It takes time, a long time, longer than most people think, longer than we think in most cases. When you think about human nature, which is the struggle that the Apostle Paul even had, and many times people look at him as being this great spiritual giant of a human, yet he still struggled with it mightily, did he not? He even references in chapter 8 of Romans, verse 7, is because the carnal mind is an enemy of God, and it's not subject to the law of God. You know, human nature is unto itself a law of sin, as he references. And it, it pulls us into defilement, and it seeks to destroy us. And Satan obviously has a foothold in the heart that Jeremiah references in chapter 17, verse 9, as deceitful above all things. It seems like we have a lot stacked up against us, does it not? But we have a lot working for us as well, if we will utilize the pure heart concept and cleanse ourselves. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 15. There's something that Jesus references here that I think is important for us to look at the actual words because it speaks and should speak to the heart of the matter for us as well. And Matthew chapter 15, and of course, the first part of this particular chapter, Jesus is referencing the traditions and the commandments of men what we would oftentimes look at as rabbinical Judaism, adding on to the Word of God and adding all these other things and putting, making them more important. And at the same time, we see cultural Christianity saying, you don't have to do any of that. Just believe in Jesus Christ. And as most case with human reasoning, neither one are right. That's why we go to the Word of God. But in verse 15, Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And of course, he's referencing this whole idea that he's, um, earlier when he's talking about the mouth and the defilement of what, what goes in your mouth doesn't defile you, even if you've got uh, unclean hands. He says, you are still lacking in understanding also. So his own disciples still lack in understanding. How much more do you and I lack? Just a thought. Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slanders. These are the things which defile the man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Now... It's probably a good idea to wash your hands, but understand that that's not spiritual defilement. It's what's in the heart. And I won't turn again for the sake of time, but I'll reference 1 Peter 1, verse 22. Obedience to the truth through the Spirit purifies the character. It puts within us the right habits. You know, I know we reference this many times in 1 Corinthians 13, where the Apostle Paul makes reference that we see dimly through, you know, a mirror. And of course, we realize that the mirrors they had were nowhere near as, as good as the mirrors you have now. Um, Leanne and I were watching something the other night on TV, and this was um, in Scotland in the um, 14 or 1300s or 1700s, I'll get it right. And I mean, even the mirrors then, and you looked at the lady looking at herself, and how can you tell anything? That is so dark. And there's no doubt it was even darker in the form of the Apostle Paul. So we see that in order to see God, as we reference with a pure heart in Matthew 5, 8, we have to be brought closer to God. And, you know, when we think about this closeness of God, I've got a couple of things here on the screen, that uh, reference points about Matthew 5, 8. And you see the word that's listed for see. It's interesting, that word see, it has two connotations. To see like I see, Mr. Vogan, but then to also see in the way that you see into the heart of the individual. It's two versions of seeing. Seeing and knowing and just seeing a physical representation. To be the pure in heart in order to see God, 
You have to have the pure heart. There's reference to this in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Let's, it's the same identical word that we see in Matthew 5, verse 8, for the pure in heart. And in Revelation 1, I can get my Bible to that page, verse 7, it says, Behold, his coming is with the clouds. Of course, the day of a, a feast of trumpets. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. So we see here that people will see, and it's the same identical word for those that are pure in heart that can see God. They will see the physical Jesus Christ returning. Yes. But notice in chapter 22 of Revelation, the same identical Greek word again is listed here in verse 4. But now we're seeing that this is a seeing of something that is far different. It goes on in verse 3, we'll back up and says, And there will no longer be any curse in the throne of God, and the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. And they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, because they will see him as he is, and they will be able to understand and to discern. One final scripture, let's turn over to Titus chapter 1. You know, Jesus makes reference in one of his parables about the eye that sees and the darkness and, and whatnot, but with God's Holy Spirit, we're able to see and understand in that we can discern the person of God, of Jesus Christ, that we are to be, being like him. But then we also are able to eventually see him when our redemption draws near when he comes back physically to the earth. But if we don't have a pure heart, we won't be seen, either, either form. But here in Titus, for one final scripture, verse 15 through 16, chapter 1, to purge all things, or to the pure rather, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but their deeds, they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless of any good deed. You know, as I put in the bulletin today, it's important for us to grasp the importance of understanding that the only way for us to see the pure things is to have a pure heart, to have the right eye, as he mentions in his parable. And if we're not careful with our deeds, they can lead us astray to be unbelieving. And over the course of time, if sin continues, it will, dis it will destroy us in much the same way that we see with David, I mean with the Pharisees. We see the example in David of being pure. We see the example of David of asking for a clean heart. And we need to have that clean heart so that we don't reach the level of what the Pharisees would, who would not enter the kingdom of heaven.